Hi folks, Paul Roberts here. I'm going to do this fall's video fishing journals as I did the summer our jungle warfare journals as a series. Uh, this time it's a short course in what fall actually is and what that means from the fish side of the fence. Uh, the whys underpinning the what's, where's, and how's. Uh, as I see it, the whys offer uh, what I call exportable knowledge. Uh, basic knowledge with legs <laughs> that you can take with you from water body to water body. Then we'll hit the water in succeeding videos to see uh, how I read um, and then adapt my fishing to those changing conditions and circumstances that the fall transition brings. Um, and, and believe me, it, it comes in spades. First, I need to introduce our fall transition laboratory pond, uh, the one we'll be focusing in on uh, for our next few video fishing journals. How many journals that'll be <laughs> depends on how quickly winter conditions roll in, um, and, and it appears to be coming fast this year. In keeping with our jungle warfare theme, I chose another heavily vegetated public pond, a uh, common bass habitat in many places around the bass fishing world. Uh, and this one's an absolute dish pan, contour-wise, four to five feet deep across the entire basin uh, with a soft bottom of uh, or organic ooze. Water clarity is normally very high in this pond, owing to a dense carpet of vegetation that stretches uh, almost entirely across the bottom, nearly shore to shore. And that vegetation grows uh, nearly to the surface over much of the pond during the summer. There's virtually no bassy hard cover or substrate, uh, something that could make many bass anglers a bit uneasy, uh, maybe even heading off to find a different pond. But the bass do just fine in it, um, evidenced by the fact that it grows some large ones. But weedy dishpan contoured waters like this can be a bit overwhelming uh, for anglers, since bottom structural contours are such an important focus in helping us decipher areas uh, where bass can focus their hunting activity and, and that we can take advantage of. How do bass, without major bottom contour changes, operate? Such challenges just require that we look a little closer. Despite the dense vegetation, these next video fishing journals aren't more uh, jungle warfare videos exactly, uh, because things change out there. These are instead fall transition videos. What a transition is, is change. And the further north you go across the, the bass's uh, range, the greater and more rapid those changes are. So in terms of timing, if you didn't have your finger on the speed and intensity of those changes, you could easily arrive on the water ready to rock with inappropriate expectations or maybe worse, <laughs> the wrong tackle to be able to adjust those expectations. Been there, done that a, a lot over the years. So. It pays to understand what's actually happening during the fall transition, uh, be able to recognize the signs, uh, and uh, make educated guesses as to how the fish might be responding. The fall transition essentially revolves around the dismantling of the food chain that developed over the summer months. And it occurs before our very eyes, if we know what to look for. 
uh, it essentially revolves around the sun, just like our planet does. <laughs> uh, interesting how that is. Uh, I, I wonder if they're related. <laughs> the fall transition actually begins as day length begins to rapidly drain away at the end of summer. Taking photosynthetic production, the foundation of the food chain, with it. The vast majority of this production uh, and growth for everyone else in line up the chain occurs during the summer months when the intensity and duration of sunlight is maximal. Winter is a period when production bottoms out uh, to near standstill in the north. Fall is the transition period in between and the further north we go the more rapid those changes are. The further south the less intense they tend to be. Autumn dieback uh, starts here in my neck of the woods through the month of August as the days get shorter at an accelerating rate. The first thing I see are dead and dying aquatic plants, uh, the most light sensitive among them going first. The plants then begin to rot, uh, disintegrating into ever finer organic materials, uh, classified as particulate and dissolved organic materials. These organic materials uh, build up in the water column and at the surface, changing the appearance of the water and often uh, resulting in a, a funky smelling soup. <laughs> the more fertile the water body is, the funkier it tends to get. This soup is so funky because it's, it's rotting um, or, or composting. As they compost, these organic materials disintegrate into ever finer pieces, from coarse chunks to finer bits and to chemicals that dissolve into the water. We can see this stuff and the fungi and bacteria that are actually doing the work if we know what we're looking at. Again, the first things we see are dead and dying plants, uh, turned brown and then broken and drifting. Coarser materials, uh, bits of rotting vegetation, then get colonized by bacteria that often uh, uh, cause clumping and, and, and actual fluffing of the, the, that coarse plant material. Um, this process is called flocculation. Flocculant materials are light enough to suspend in the water column, often adding a cloudy brownish color to the water. This coarser stuff, along with plankton blooms, create well, what's called turbid or uh, more commonly murky water. Muddy water, uh, by the way, is just another kind of turbidity that's created by, um, you guessed it, muds. Uh, inorganic particles like clay and silt that can enter the water column by uh, rain, snow, or uh, sometimes wind events. Events that can happen any time of year. Uh, but here, uh, for the fall transition, the water clarity and color changes we're talking about are from the organic materials that get released rapidly into the water column as plants die and break down. Up here in the north, they die quickly and nearly completely. In the far south, the process may take longer and many plants may simply have their growth cur curtailed. The organic plant materials that end up dissolved in the water uh, are the cause of what's called uh, stained water. Um, in the same way in, in which coffee or tea turns the water in your cup uh, brown or green. Dissolved materials are released into the water column and become the fertilizing nutrients that fuel the fall phytoplankton blooms. Similarly, waters that receive uh, fallen plant materials, like, like leaves from the surrounding land, may take on a, a root beer brown stain. These outside sources of organic material are called allochthonous sources. Water is situated in forests and surrounded by trees. Uh, deciduous trees in particular may get more than their fair share of leaves, resulting in tannic water that can look uh, nearly black in color. Commonly, a part of this funky soup we're talking about is not only hanging in the water column, uh, it, it often can be seen on the water surface as well, uh, as sheets of algae, fungi, and bacteria. Bacterial slicks often look like a, a thin oil or gasoline slick on the water surface, um, and, and at a distance may appear as a hazy uh, sheen uh, reflecting sunlight.
these decomposition events I'm describing um, and that we'll see in our fall transition laboratory pond, uh, a small shallow water body, are essentially the same responses that are seen on larger, deeper water bodies that uh, thermally stratify. What happens in these waters that stratify is that large amounts of organic material uh, ends up sequestered below the thermocline in the deep uh, lake basin over the production year. And then is ra rather suddenly released into the upper water column when the lake thermally turns over in the fall, bringing on the potential for its own brand of funky soup. Uh, in such waters we may not see much coarse material, uh, uh, but the other signs of decomposition can appear, um, often uh, uh, followed by uh, green and brownish plankton blooms. More fertile waters with much aquatic vegetation, uh, li like our laboratory pond, will often take on a cloudy or milky gray-green to brownish color uh, due to uh, a mix of materials and decomposers present. Such funky soups, however they manifest themselves, are all evidence that the fall transition is in full swing right in front of us. Realize too uh, that in large or topographically complex water bodies, the range, intensity, and timing of decomposition events will likely vary across that lake, allowing you to make decisions as to where or how to spend your valuable time. Uh, this can even be true, actually, on small ponds, um, smaller waters, as you'll see in practice in Video Fishing Journal 26 coming up. As vegetation, including phytoplankton, dies, it can no longer produce oxygen. And the flourishing bacterial populations that are feeding on that suddenly released organic material use oxygen themselves. This may result in a drop in dissolved oxygen levels in the water, uh, especially overnight when all photosynthesis shuts down. Come daylight, especially on bright sunny days, photosynthesis will resume wherever live green vegetation is holding on. Whether oxygen plays a significant role for the fish in a given area or not, live green vegetation is worth looking for because live vegetation supports more upper level food chain activity than dead stuff does uh, attracting fish. There's another piece to the fall transition angling puzzle too in terms of uh, the upper food chain. Uh, the end we anglers are focused on and that is that all that dying, collapsing vegetation uh, leaves many prey fishes nearly homeless, forcing them to seek cover uh, as well as food and, and sometimes oxygen elsewhere. When vegetation beds collapse, fish may uh, simply abandon them and go looking for alternative areas that offer uh, better cover and food. The food part most often entails surviving food, ch uh, food chain production, uh, where the greener pastures remain uh, especially. However, I've found that bass will still use dead weeds, um, but appear to hang back away from the edges in, in open water. This is a good part of the reason why large bass are so vulnerable to being caught in the fall, and indeed through the entire cold water period. Uh, they, like their prey, are now exposed. Uh, the advantage we anglers have over uh, ospreys and herons, say, <laughs> at this time of year, is that we anglers don't have to first see the fish to catch them, a real hindrance for the birds, and, and a boon for the bass and the angl and, and anglers <laughs> when that autumn sun is hanging so low in the sky. As the fall season progresses, heat is a factor too. Uh, uh, their penchant for green vegetation and heat is as if the fish are seeking the remaining areas that still provide a, a little bit of summer. Uh, keep this in mind as you explore your lake in, in the fall looking for fish. If I were to single out one most important element, it would be cover. Cover for displaced fish. Uh, 
after their house has been rearranged, so to speak. Cover that can house and hopefully feed fishes. Prey fishes being smaller, look for cages of cover for safety's sake uh, from marauding predators. And bass uh, look for larger cover objects, um, or at least they require cages with larger gaps to accommodate their larger bodies. But they greatly prefer objects as close to prey as possible. Most often, this puts predator and prey in the same, uh, same locations. Thus, look for prey, and there are probably some bass uh, there making use of them. So, where might we look specifically? Here, I'm going to fo uh, start focusing more in on our shallow, weedy lab pond. Um, I will say that, that lakes with uh, open water prey types, uh, larger lakes often um, uh, with, with uh, shad or perch, um, and supporting appropriate limnological layouts for them, may require uh, you to be fishing deep in the fall. Many lakes will have fish both shallow and deep. Uh, but in our fall transition lab pond, um, and in many, if not most, natural lakes, the shallows, or at least surface waters, can be key. This is because the surface waters are where the remaining heat energy from the sun can still collect. If you want to know more about this, uh, check some of my other video fishing journals, especially in the transition seasons. Um, I, I cover that stuff in just about every fishing journal. Shorelines attract fish in the fall, in uh, just about any lake. Uh, in many larger lakes, shad begin to show up in coves and creek arms about the time that floater period is dropping away. How quickly they react apparently has to do with uh, late summer open water zooplankton abundance um, and, and the severity of that funky soup uh, that rolls up during turnover. Both at least can move shad into the shallows, uh, at least until surface waters get cold. Here in our laboratory pond, it's pretty much all about sunfishes, uh, and, and their shoreline movements appear to be mostly about cover, um, but also about heat. Uh, bluegills in particular are veritable heat pigs. <laughs> so incident shorelines that receive more direct sunlight can keep, uh, first keeps aquatic uh, plants holding on a bit longer. Uh, many cover types can attract fish, but live plants or the additional live plants can be a real plus, um, oftentimes the main show providing uh, cover, food, and oxygen. Uh, you know, food chain stuff. The addition of heat, though, on those shorelines is almost magnetically attractive to sunfishes, however, um, and to bass. The shoreline isn't the whole story by any, uh, by any means. Uh, main lake and pond areas, uh, uh, the main mass of water, can offer uh, several, several things. First, the sheer amount of real estate may simply increase the chances of there being some um, intact uh, cover or structural objects for uh, fish to continue making their livings at. Major weed beds okay, often have more room to develop over summer in, in the main basin, um, and being so large uh, are often able to remain intact longer into the season, um, even into winter. Uh, major beds may even uh, be recognizable from a distance, uh, which can help you in, in paring down real estate. Uh, note the slick created by this major weed bed, um, interrupting a, a wind-generated current. This spot was in our fall transition laboratory pond, okay, and yes, it turned out to be a key location. Deeper main mass areas may also continue to support live vegetation. These are usually deeper water species that don't need as much light to begin with, uh, such as uh, coontail and cara. Finally, main masses of water can retain heat, uh, remaining more stable in water temperature than the immediate shallows can, something that gains in significance as uh, fall transitions uh, into winter. Okay. That should uh, suffice to clue us in, in as to what we're about to head into. 
So, armed with this bit of exportable knowledge, let's hit the water for Video Fishing Journal 26.